tonight from life-changing super suits. How's it feel? Feels amazing. To the scientific power of prayer. Religion is one of the most important influences on people's behavior. And is all of this just one big computer simulation? How do we know there's a real world out there? The best of the Big Idea 2017 begins right now. Hello, I'm Steve Lacey. All year we've brought you stories that focus on science and technology. Well, tonight we bring you the very best. We begin with an adult living center outside of Boston. Remarkably, ALS patients are living there as independently as possible. It's because one man refused to let the disease take over his life. Fox 5 Stacey Delicat has more. At first look, there's nothing remarkable about this bedroom with its family photos, collection of DVDs, and sports memorabilia. It's who lives here that makes it so extraordinary. Welcome to my home. Steve Sailing is 48 years old and has been living with ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, for 10 years. The disease cripples the body, but not the mind. To understand what it is like to have ALS, lay down and have someone tie a 50 pound weight to each foot and each hand. You will try like hell to move, but you just don't make any progress. Steve can move his head very subtly, but that's it. Most people in his condition wind up in traditional nursing homes, immobile and completely dependent. But after his diagnosis, Steve, an architect, was determined to avoid that fate. So he designed the place where he and 19 other Others now live, the ALS residents at the Leonard Florence Center for Living outside of Boston. This is not a nursing home with residential trappings. It is my home that happens to provide skilled nursing services. If you look closely, you'll see a tiny dot on the bridge of Steve's glasses. It acts like a computer mouse, and a camera attached to Steve's wheelchair can read its movements and translate them to his computer screen. It's how he speaks and navigates around the house. I can open my door, control the lights, the window shade, the thermostat, the TV, and home theater, and any electrical device anywhere in the room. Nothing about the residence looks remarkably high tech, but in fact there are wires running through the walls and the ceilings, there are sensors all over, tools that enable the residents here to have a kind of independence they wouldn't have anywhere else. In fact, all of the technological components here are off the shelf. Anyone can buy them. The system is called Peak, and under Steve's direction, it's been implemented according to the ALS residents' needs. Once I'm up and dressed, I can open the door, roll out of my house, call for the elevator, come downstairs, go out, do what I want. Mike Robbins of Staten Island is one of Steve's housemates. He's had ALS for 20 years, but in the last few years lost use of his arms and legs. He's fortunate to still be able to speak and uses a mouth stylus to operate the peak system. I'll be honest, if I was still home or in a regular nursing home, I think I'd rather just you know, go to sleep one night and not wake up. Then there's Patrick O'Brien, a 41-year-old filmmaker who chronicled his decline in an award-winning documentary, Trans Fatty Lives. At 2.30, I find out if I have ALS. Now he can communicate only through an eyebrow. He's also on a ventilator, which under almost any other circumstance would confine him to a bed in a hospital-like nursing home. It's where he was until he got a spot here two years ago. Now he's not only up and out of bed every day, he's even been to Disney World. How has being here changed your life? This place is all about living. If not for the Leonard Florence Center for Living, it is very unlikely I would be here giving this interview. What Steve has, has accomplished using his, his eyes only um, has, has helped all these other individuals live a very meaningful, dignified life. Barry Berman is the CEO of the Chelsea Jewish Foundation, the parent nonprofit of the Leonard Florence Center and Steve Sailing residence. It's the only place in the world that we know of that has this level of service and care for an individual with ALS. What keeps me awake at night and what saddens me daily is that we could fill this entire building with individuals who have um, ALS and, and similar neurological diseases. According to the ALS Association, an average of 15 Americans are newly diagnosed with ALS daily, more than 5,600 people a year. But there are only 20 spots here, all funded by Medicaid and generous donors. Does it cost the individuals anything? 
the end of it with pay nothing. Berman believes this model could and should be replicated throughout the world, but most ALS donations go to researching a cure. I hope I live long enough to see a day when, when this disease is cured, but I think there has to be a balance of, taking, of spending money and resources on research, but also caring for individuals that are living this nightmare every single day. There's a motto on the screen of Steve's computer that he looks at with almost every move he makes. Until medicine proves otherwise, technology is the cure. There is a big difference between being kept alive and living a life. The ALS residence is the only place in the world that I know of that provides the opportunity for people with ALS to reclaim their life and to live it to the fullest. Stacy Delacat, Fox 5 News. Can religion and spirituality be measured scientifically? Intensive research on the brain says yes. Sharon Crowley takes a closer look at the power of faith. How do you feel after you pray? Do you feel happy. happy? I think you feel a little bit centered and I think reassured that you're thinking about other people and that there are more things in the world than just us. It's a surreal experience that you open your eyes and you thank God for being alive. It's a good feeling, you just feel well. I just feel better about life and myself and my blessings. The spiritual feeling these faithful describe may now be supported by science. Religion is one of the most important influences on people's behavior. Dr. Jeffrey Anderson is an associate professor of neuroradiology at the University of Utah. What we wanted to understand is what's happening in the brain while somebody has a spiritual or religious experience. To find out what's happening, Dr. Anderson conducted a research study. A group of devout Mormons agreed to have their brains scanned with MRI machines while they were watching videos or reading about spiritual things. They talked about feelings of peace and physical sensations of warmth. Researchers said some were in tears by the end of the scan. The regions of the brain that lit up were part of the reward circuit of the brain. We learned that there are characteristic regions of the brain that are active when somebody has a spiritual or religious experience. The study shows scientific proof that something physically happens in the brain when we pray or have a spiritual experience. Maybe it seems obvious, but that something makes us feel better. It's been hypothesized that religious experience is a reward trigger for the brain, but we weren't expecting to see it so robust. This is an area that's also active when people experience reward from music or from romantic or parental love, from drugs like cocaine or methamphetamines. And this places religious experience in that same class of, of rewarding experiences. Dr. Anderson was intrigued by what happens to our brains when we pray, because so many of us make key life decisions based on our spiritual beliefs. People make a lot of really important decisions based on these spiritual feelings. And we'd like to understand how do those arise? Are they conditioning in a sense? Do we have a stimulus that produces a response? And is that a reason why people come to believe the things that they do? Everything that flows from the human imagination that creates the world in which we live is a product of our ability to believe. Pastor A.R. Bernard oversees the Christian Cultural Center Megachurch in Brooklyn. He believes in the study's findings of a body and spirit connection. We make decisions with our head and calculate, but at the end of the day, it's how we feel deep in our gut that determines the path that we take. Rabbi Arthur Schneier of Park East Synagogue on the Upper East Side of Manhattan says he also believes in the study's findings. He thinks prayer can be transformative. It gives you a sense of peace. There is a connection. It's not just the physical body, the mental activity. And again, I come back, every human being has a soul. And that manifests itself. When you are engaged in prayer, you just cut out every negative, harmful impact on your physical and emotional well-being. While the study only looked at Mormons, researchers believe their findings would be able to be replicated in any religion. Sharon Crowley, Fox 5 News. Coming up.
Imagine being super strong in an instant. I'm gonna try to lift this 45 pound box up and see how this goes. Plus, are we living in a reality or one big simulation? If we're in a simulation, do we have free will? Next. A high tech company outside San Francisco is changing lives in a remarkable way. It's not only helping paralyzed people walk, but also creating suits that give people superhuman strength. Fox 5's Liz Dahlum has the story from Northern California. Carrots, we have green beans. In reality is life being disabled is still life. You still can do everything that anybody else can do. It's just slightly different or slower. Stephen Sanchez grew up here in Northern California. And one summer day before his senior year of high school, everything changed. I was into BMX, so riding uh, bicycles and doing jumps and tricks and stuff like that. When I first went off the jump, I didn't feel right in the air, so I threw my bike and then all of a sudden, that threw me, twisting me. Steve landed on his back and broke his spine, making him a paraplegic at just 17 years old. Getting thrown into a wheelchair and a whole new lifestyle. Something Steve's girlfriend Ashley, who he shares an apartment with, knows all too well. She's also a paraplegic and understands what it's like to live in a wheelchair. Steve drives himself an hour every day to get to work. The office is here in Emeryville, California, at this very nondescript building. It's called Sudex, and what is happening inside these walls is changing lives. How's it feel? Feels amazing. From a wheelchair to standing upright to walking. Being in this suit, everybody reacts so differently to me. Um, and I can see that, but I also feel it. Steve is in charge of quality control and is the chief pilot of the Phoenix Exoskeleton. The company was founded by Homayun Kazaruni, an engineering professor at the University of California, Berkeley, who has been developing exoskeletons since the early 2000s. The idea was to uh, create a better quality of life for people with mobility disorders. The engineers here produce a number of different devices, including the Phoenix. It's not yet on the market, as the Food and Drug Administration is still considering whether to approve it, but Kazaruni expects approval to come early next year. The company is made up of 30 employees focused on keeping infrastructure and cost at a minimum. We need little amount of hardware, most emphasis on a software, to create minimal device that they can afford it. The office, which is in an old warehouse, has a relaxed Kelly vibe. All of the engineers at Sudex are former students of Kazaruni's at Berkeley. Passion is first. Once there is a passion, then th that passion drives to learn. That passion drives to do more innovation. So there's a lot of UC Berkeley degrees that put A this lot together. of degrees here. There's a PhD <laughs> here. There is one on this side. There's one at the knee. That's just 40% of the engineers are women, like Yoon Jung, who is also one of Sudex's co-founders. Yoon has spent the past seven years building the hip motors of the Phoenix exoskeleton. The idea is to make this as narrow and slim as possible, so this becomes more practical when the user wears it and then they want to walk through narrow aisles of grocery stores or even airplanes and so on. Less machinery means a lower price tag for the consumer. We think the cost of that will come down to somewhere between $15,000 to $20,000. That's the price of a powered wheelchair. So seeing Steve walk, what is that like for you? Oh, it's awesome. This is the best part of my job. Michael McKinley, another co-founder, developed the prototype for the Phoenix Exoskeleton and has worked with Steve for the past five years, perfecting the robot. This is the basic system that Steve's wearing here. Mm -hmm. It's comprised of a computer that's controlling all the actions, controlled through a, a Bluetooth connection to that computer. Uh, the computer is controlling a hip motor and uh, a knee uh, actuator. And what's particularly cool about this system is that we only have two motors in the whole system to control the gait, and the knee is, uh, is just a brake, basically. But that takes practice. Jim Burnett is still learning how to use the Phoenix. He's one of 25 subjects who travel to Sudex every week to work with a physical therapist and learn how to use the prosthetic robot. What would it mean to have something like this at your disposal every day? It would be fantastic. I'd use it at home all the time and 
be able to work around the house and get a lot of things done. Sudex is also working to bring robots to able-bodied people. Nate, what are we doing? I tried the Back X, which does not require FDA approval and is already selling for about $3,000. With the flip of a switch, the device gives the user superhuman strength. So the back X is off right now, and I'm going to try to lift this 45-pound box up and see how this goes, okay? So, okay, heavy, really heavy. <laughs> I'm going to put it down. Ooh. And now I will turn the back X on. Flip of a switch, and it comes up a lot easier. <laughs> how am I able to lift that? Right, so uh, what, what we have here is we have some torque generators mm -hmm. right here on either side. And what they're doing is when you bend down, they're working with your body to pull your body back up. Or in this case, push your body back up. So that way then when you're lifting, your back muscles aren't working as hard. And instead, the exo is the thing that's actually doing the work for you. So it makes things feel a lot lighter. Yeah, right. We, uh, we have some studies out that show you can reduce back muscle activation by up to 66%. This is what an assembly line could look like with this extra support. The combination of a human and robot is by far more productive in many situations than the robot by itself. Steve knows that because he lives it and can't imagine a future without one. When I'm in the suit, it's raised my confidence levels, it's raised my energy levels, it's raised my awareness of my body. From San Francisco, California, Liz Dollum, Fox 5 News. Coming up, are we just characters in one big computer simulation? I should say that technologically, it's possible. Stay with us. Are we real or are we just living our lives in a big computer simulation? That's a very real theory that some of the world's top minds in science and technology refuse to dismiss. Here's Dan Bowens. The basic idea of simulation theory is to question the reality around us. It's just that there's some more advanced civilization than us that have, uh, can recreate um, the universe that we observe. Is everything that we know and experience simply either in our imagination or in the manifestation of a world that's being controlled? If we're in a simulation, do we have free will? As a philosophy professor at NYU, David Chalmers focuses on the concept of consciousness, questions of what the mind perceives as reality. How do we know we're not in a simulation where everything is an illusion? A simulation, a mastery of complex algorithms creating a cosmic artificial world, all set up by our ancestors or some other intelligent being. Concepts that sound very red pill, blue pill, neo in the matrix. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. I mean, a lot of this is really way out, but some of the questions are actually kind of relevant. So the idea of uh, simulation theory is, is pretty controversial for a number of different reasons. First, I should say that technologically, it's possible. Possible? Really? Hod Lipson is a professor of engineering at Columbia University specializing in robotics. The rate at which artificial intelligence is progressing, which is, which is nothing short of exponential, we have machines that learn. 40 years ago, all we had was Pong. Now it's immersive, lifelike games like SimCity. Centuries from now, billionaire and SpaceX founder Elon Musk believes humans will have the capability to create beyond what we can imagine. He shocked the tech world by putting the odds we're not in someone else's simulation at one in one billion. Either we're going to create simulations that are indistinguishable from reality or civilization will cease to exist. Yeah, so Elon Musk is wrong. Wrong, says Peter Morgan, the chief artificial intelligence officer with Ivy Data Science. It's a company specializing in AI education. He says there are ways to test the limits of our physical world. And one of the measurements we take is of uh, cosmic rays, which are constantly bombarding us and if we're living in a simulation then the actual energy distribution will be asymmetric. So far good for us he says everything is lining up. Wouldn't you want to go back to you know any number of eras and experience those? Because says Winslow Burleson director of the NYU X lab at the College of Nursing what the debate really boils down to a fundamental question of humanity why are we here? You can't necessarily know if there's a God or not. You can take it on faith. These are very profound questions. And I think for me, I try and, and be the best person I can be. I try and explore and discover and foster that in other people. That's life as we know it. 
Dan Bowens, Fox 5 News. We'll be right back. In addition to these stories, Fox 5 has a long list of big idea reports that spotlight how the world is changing in science and technology. You can catch all the big ideas Fox 5 has done on our YouTube page. Well, that does it for the best of the big idea for 2017. I'm Steve Lacey. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.